um, breaking through a bit the, the the topic of this of this session because I'm I'm uh, speaking instead of just me that could, could not make it uh, because of COVID. So, so this is actually not the title that it should be. It should be the epigenetic log logic at, at gene activation and and maybe this is one of the main messages of my my talk. This change on this this work. Uh, this is mostly the work of uh, Beatrice Chevorsery, uh, who's a PhD student in my group, who's now a postdoc at Yale, and Sylvia Prince Luke, who took care of the experimental part. Uh, I'm not sure how familiar you are with uh, thinking in the field of the role of histone modifications in the regulation of gene expression. But essentially, there is this hypothesis that the stone code in which there is a role for histone modifications in the regulation of gene expression with a number of histone modifications positively associated with uh, gene expression and the number of uh, modifications uh, uh, playing a, a repressive role in gene expression. And I think that for people that are outside of the field, this is more or less uh, the thinking. You know? And there is, there is a lot of evidence that this is the case. Uh, these are, for instance, uh, the work of, of Martin Bingron in which they, they develop methods to predict uh, levels of gene expression based on levels of histone modifications with very good accuracy uh, and extrapolable from one cell line to another. This is a work actually by Zipping Wang here, in which again, she was able to predict, or the group actually, I think I am out on this paper, uh, was able to predict levels of gene expression from, from uh, histone modifications with, with high accuracy. I apologize, Sipin, because I didn't uh, warn you that I was going to say that this is wrong. But anyway, we'll <laughs> that we were wrong. <laughs> anyway, anyway, we uh, uh, some time ago we published this paper in which we showed that uh, there are cases in which you can get expression without uh, without uh, so changing in in with the with the, without actually the canonical uh, uh, histone modifications involved in gene expression. And I'm sorry, I brag about this. Of discover because discover it's a the cover inspiring a, in a Catalan painter Dali and this is I'm sorry that Hagen is not here because this is by 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 Luisa's uh, Luisa Lentes is 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 Hagen's wife and and actually we had a number of of covers inspired in, in, in Catalan painters and you saw this by by Hag, by actually Hagen showed this what on genome research as well this is also by Luisa this is by Luisa in a paper that we published together uh, back to back with Gill, and this is Gaudí. This is Picasso, but Picasso is not Catalan, but doesn't really matter. Uh, this is not done by Luisa. This is done by an artificial intelligence program. I wanted to apologize to Hagen. <laughs> we not, because we are moving to... Anyway, so we were not the first or the last to actually pinpoint that there are cases in which we see expression with this canonical behavior of histone modifications before and after. So we were actually interested in, in this issue. Is there a causal role for histone modifications in the regulation of gene expression. And as far as I can tell, there are two ways in which you, want, you can assess causality. If you want to know whether A is the cause of B, or actually you want to, I'm not sure you can prove this, but you can disprove, you can actually do a disruption experiment. If you disrupt A and B still occurs, clearly A cannot be the cause of B. But there is another way of doing this. This is observe the two phenomena, A and B during time. And if B always occurred before A, A in the world in which we live cannot be the cause of B. So that's what we, that's what we did. We took a, a transdifferentiation model, a simple transdifferentiation model, the transdifferentiation from B cells to macrophages. This is a, this is a model that has been very well studied at our institute by Thomas Graff. So we had the expertise and we actually obtain uh, RNA-seq and chip-seq on many histone modifications at uh, 12 different time points during this, during this process. I am a little bit embarrassed to use bulk RNA-seq data in this meeting with everybody is talking about single cell, but I think I had good reasons to say that single cell would not help at all to, into, this, into this case because there is no way in which we can study the same cell over time, right? We have to destroy the cell every time that we do these experiments. And actually, this is one of the major challenges, I think, in this field that when we, didn't, we discussed the other day, I think that we did not mention this, but the fact that we destroy the cell not only has an impact on the cell, 
but actually makes impossible to study the behavior of the cell over time. So this process occurs with transcriptional with massive transcriptional changes is the transliteration between different lineages. So this means that it's a great model to study, to, to study phenomena associated with transcription because you see many transcriptional changes. This is an homogeneous cellular system. So it's not a developmental model in which you have many, many cell types. This is just one cell type that transliterates to another. It's highly synchronized. So, and actually something that we did, uh, which I think it's important is that we did all the assays in the sample of trans differentiated cells. So the RNA seq and the chip seq is not from different experiments, it's from the same pool, large pool of cells that are the trans differentiated at the same time. So I think this is the closest that I can think to a, to a single cell experiment. And, and then we, we measure the expression and the histone marks, and it's a very simple data type, right? So we have uh, and the values of, uh, of, of expression. Is this working? Well, we have the values of expression here at the, for the genes and the time points and the values of the chromatin marks, nine chromatin marks, uh, time points and genes. And then we measure the, of course, there's always some arbitrarity here. We just measure the expression and the chromatin marks at different, the, sorry, the chromatin marks at different sites around the gene body, mostly at the promoter for most of the marks. And of course, we could try to recapitulate what has been published in the field. So we could compute at each some point in steady state, the correlation across genes right between gene expression and chromatin marks. And indeed, we recapitulate what has actually been published, very high correlation for the positively associated chromatin marks and negative associated for the marks that are canonically, canonically assumed to be repressive. But of course, now we have something which I think is better because we have the 12 time points and then we can compute the correlation per gene across the time point. So we can compute the distance point expression and the chromatin marks. And when we compute, now we have a correlation per gene, and when we compute the distribution of these correlations, what we observe is that the correlation is quite substantially lower, right? When we measure over time, the changes in expression and chromatin marking correlation is lower than the one that has been computed on a steady state. And actually, in some cases, it's contrary to what has been uh, published in the fields of, for instance, h 3 k 9 trimethylation, which is typically considered a repressive mark. We see it positively associated with uh, expression a long time. So why why is this? Well, we think that this is because the correlations computed in this state are partially par partially artifactual. And the way in which I am going to show this is just by randomizing the association between gene expression and and and, and histone modification. So this is one gene. We have the expression values across the, the 12 time points. We have the histone modification values across the 12 time points, which just randomize, so we destroy the association absolutely. And of course, when we compute the correlation across time points, the correlation is zero, right, as you expect. But when we compute the correlation in the study state, on data that's randomized, we still see five very high correlation, right? Very high correlation uh, for positively associated marks, even though I emphasize that yes, we have destroyed all the correlation. This is because I think there are uh, the constraint structure of the transcriptome. So there are genes that are always very highly expressed and they are always very highly marked and genes that are never expressed and never marked. And these are always the same across all the time points and therefore uh, they dominate the correlation. But there is, this doesn't really reflect any real association between expression and histone modification. So it's not only that correlation doesn't really reflect causation is actually correlation in this case doesn't even reflect association. So to we have a sort of complex, uh, a, a, well, simple but complex at the structure in the sense that we have many chromatin modifications. So in order to get an idea of how all these modifications behave uh, globally in relation with gene expression, we use this hidden Markov models, but these are, let me see, these are not hidden Markov models in which we partition the genome sequence, we partition the time. Right, we partition the time at each at each gene. Right, we have at each time point we have a set of marks that define the chromatin state of the gene. And what we do is we for each gene we have a partition of the gene across the across the twelve time points. Huh? I think that I don't need to emphasize this in this audience, but it's not obvious always that this is conceptually different to the typical hidden Markov models that has been used in the field in which the what is partition is the genome sequence, right? Here, we are not producing the, sequence, the genome sequence. Here, for each gene, we have a hidden Markov model that, in principle, describes right, the evolution of the chromatin state across times. And what we did find, 
Of course, this is always very arbitrary. You can go from five to three to 300 states, but we found that uh, a model with five states, it's a good compromise between interpretability and uh, complexity of the model. And so we think that most genes are in one of these major chromatin states, uh, which are actually defined by an increasing uh, amount of, of marking by histone modifications. And uh, uh, are genes in which there, there is no there is no marking, genes in which there is low marking, mostly for H3K4 mono and demethylation. There are genes that are bivalent marking by uh, positive and negative marks. And then there are genes that are active and genes that are very strongly marked. And when we compute this over the genes and we just cluster the genes according to the states in which they are, what we see is that although there are cases in which you see transitions, transitions from one state to another, right? Most genes remain in the same state, in the same chromatin state during transdifferentiation, even though they may be differentially expressed, right? So this is the where they are stable, expressed, silent, or differentially expressed. So even genes that are differentially expressed, highly differentially expressed, they remain in the same chromatin state. That's, for instance, one case, NUCB1, in which there is a huge increase in expression, but the chromatin during transmission, but the histone modifications remain at the same at the same level, and this is not an artifact of the. This is not an artifact of the. Of I know this is a very coarse representation of the chromatin state. If we look gene by gene, mark by mark, we do see this, right? So of course we see cases in which we see uh, that the changes in the histone modification over time mirror the changes in expression. But see many genes in which we see similar changes in gene expression that are actually not reflected in changes in histone modification. So we see many genes, number of uh, comparable genes in which we see changes in histone modification gene expression without any, any associated changes in, 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 in histone modification. And vice versa, we see genes in which we don't see changes in gene expression and we actually see changes in histone modifications. And actually even for genes that are not expressed at all during the transdifferentiation, we see changes in gene expression. Of course, this doesn't mean that there is no association absolutely between gene expression and, 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 and histone modifications. We do see that there is a correlation, even when we computed a, a long time. And, um, and uh, uh, actually, when, when, when we look at the cases in which there are changes in gene expression and, and, and changes in, in chromatin modifications, the changes tend to, tend to be consistent. It's not that we see genes increase in expression and then increasing in negative marks. No changes are as you would expect right if we move from if we move from from uh, cases of low marking to high marking we see an increase in gene expression and when we move from from changes of of low mark uh, to a strong marking to less marking we see decreases in gene expression okay so to try to understand uh in which cases there was this association between gene expression and histone modifications, we did something well, we had a little bit complicated. I just will send, tell you which is the message here. The message here is that when we see a modification in a mark in one direction, essentially we see modifications in all the marks. We don't see one mark changing, one, or one type of histone modifications occurring and then the rest not occurring. We don't see a very combinatorial behavior. We see that histone marks behave more or less in a consistent way all together. Therefore, we could actually look at what was the pattern of association between, between um, gene expression and chromatin marking globally. And we found three major modes of association. Most of the genes, most of the genes that change expression, right, do not show uh, change correlated changes of gene expression, they actually have a stable marking or uncorrelated marking. Then there is a set of genes that show the canonical association between gene expression and histone modifications. And actually we see a smaller set of genes that change in expression without, without changes in chromatin modification. And the main thing that defines these genes is actually the activated status at the beginning of transdifferentiation. So these genes, that have positive correlation with gene expression are genes that tend not to be activated at the beginning of transdifferentiation. While the genes that have no, that show no correlation during, during uh, transdifferentiation are already activated at the beginning of the process. 
So we think that this indicates that maybe histone modifications play an important role in the activation of gene expression, but once the gene is already activated, they have a very secondary role in further regulation of gene expression. And then we actually focus on a set of genes that are specifically activated during transdifferentiation. So these are genes that are zero, that are not expressed at the beginning of the transdifferentiation and are activated at some point during this process so that we can actually know what happens before and after in terms of chromatin modification. And indeed, in these genes, in these genes that are activated during transdifferentiation, they are zero when we start the process and then they come activated, we see the canonical correlation or association between gene expression and histone modifications. And you can see very high, very high correlations. If we look at the genes that are already active, set of genes that are already activated at the, at the beginning of transdifferentiation, we see that the correlations are much lower. So even for instance, in this case, the gene that has a really high increase uh, in gene expression, uh, larger than this other case, we see that essentially the chromatin, the histone modifications, uh, uh, pattern is, is quite flat. Because we had this time course, and because we know in these cases, right, when the gene started activation, we could actually try to see whether there was a, a logic in the order in which marks were deposited at the promoters of the genes. And that's what, that's what we did, but we observed something uh, uh, sort of uh, unexpected, so that there are two types of genes Right? In one, it's, it's in regarding HCK27 trimethylation. The genes are either pre-marked and remain marked over the entire process, or they are never marked. So for the genes, the majority of the genes that are unmarked by HCK27 trimethylation, we just do something very simple, which is to look how often, right? One phenomena, the marking of one of, of by one histone modification precedes the marking by, by another and by expression. And we came up with this sort of logic. So we saw that only H3K4 mono and demethylation really precede gene expression. Uh, that together with gene expression, we had H3K27 acetylation and H3K9 acetylation. And then after transcription, we saw H3K4 trimethylation, H3K36 trimethylation, and, H and much later, HK, H H H4K20 monomethylation. For the cases in which the genes were already pre-marked by HCK27 trimethylation, we see that they were also essentially pre-marked by everything it's on, and only uh, HCK27 acetylation and HCK36 trimethylation follow gene expression. So we we'll look whether this could be recapitulated in some other model, but there are very few models as simple as this. This is a developmental model. And because it's a developmental model, this is a set of genes that are differentiating uh, is a different set of cell types that are differentiated that with different dynamics, which makes the data much noisier. But essentially, we recapitulated the same thing. For the genes that are activated during development, mouse development, we see much higher regulation than for the genes that are already expressed when we start looking at this process. Again, suggesting that association, that association uh, between histone modifications and gene expression plays a role specifically at the moment of act only at the moment of, 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 of gene activation. And in part, this particular case, uh, interestingly, for mouse development, the main mode is the pre-marking by H3K27 trimethylation. And in this particular case, we actually see the same behavior, right? the same behavior that we, that we saw in the case of the genes in human that were pre-marked at H3K27 trimethylation. So that H3K36 trimethylation follows expression. Um, so what, what happens at the enhancers, right? So we see that this is the behavior of the relationship between gene expression and, 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 and histone modifications at, at, um, at, uh, at the promoters. What happens at the, at, uh, at, at the enhancers? So we look at we look at two types of, let's say, enhancers. We just look at the region that's upstream of the of the of the of the promoter, and then we look at ABC uh, and look at the promoter pairs that were between uh, between five kilobases and one kilobases away. And what uh, we saw, uh, so this is this is the correlation between gene expression 
and histone modifications at the promoters, the, the data that I have shown you so far. This, right, at the promoters, this is at the distal enhancer, this is the proximal enhancers and the distal enhancers, proximal enhancers, distal enhancers. And what you can see at the genes that are activated during the differentiation, for most cases, there is a broad epigenetic environment, right, of, of marking by these marks, which actually is not present in the genes that are, uh, that are uh, already, already activated during trans differentiation, which I think further supports the idea that these histone modifications play in a specific role in, uh, in, um, in, uh, in, the act in the initial activation of genes. So what we see is that uh, chromatin markets at enhancers follows marking at promoters. So this is, the, this is the time distance between marking and gene activation at the promoters, the data that I have shown you so far. So only HCK4 bone and demethylation precedes gene expression. The other marks either co-occur or follow gene expression unlikely to be the cause of gene expression. When we look at the proximal and distal promoters, we will see even a larger delay between gene expression of marking, right? Essentially gene expression, I sorry, marking uh, follows, marking at enhancer, at enhancers follows, follows activation of, of, of gene expression. And I think that we can see it uh, more clear here. So this is, so this is, uh, I'll show you what happens during these 12 time points. So these are the genes that are not expressed at zero hours, right? These are the genes that are not expressed. All these genes will become activated during trans differentiation at different time points during trans differentiation, right? All these genes, most of these genes are pre-marked, but HCK4 mono and demethylation. This is the set of genes that are also pre-marked, but HCK27 demethylation. They are very, they, Really, there is very little marking in the genes before they are activated. Okay, now, uh, no, All right. So now we see that the genes became activated, and after the genes became activated, is when we see the marking. And marking is much more abundant in the promoters than enhances, and the enhances is further delay than at the promoters. So the genes are being expressed. At the end, we'll see all the genes expressed, and the marking following on time. Uh, for most marks, the marking at the at the promoters. So, let me conclude uh, my last my last slide. So, the the association that we see, right? Because we see this association between marking at enhancers and, and expression, uh, it's mostly mediated actually by marking at the promoters. Uh, so let me show you this case. So this is the correlation of expression between uh, for HC, between HCK and N acetylation and expression at the promoter, right? This is very high. When we this is then we compute the partial correlations, right? Uh, condition to the expression uh, to the marking at uh, the different types of enhancers, and we see that the correlation remains the same. When we compute the correlation at the uh, between the enhancers and the expression. Right for the distal enhancers and total enhancers, we see these very high values. But we condition on the marking of the promoters, we see a drop in the correlation. Right, indicating that in general, for this mark, for this mark, for this mark, and for this mark, right, the the association between uh, marking and enhancers and, and gene expression is mediated by marking of promoters. Maybe not for H3 K4 uh, monometylation, which there may be some causal role for the marking kit at, at enhancers in the, in the gene expression. Anyway, so these are the conclusion, the conclusions of this. So the average association between gene expression and protein marking is weekly than previous variables are reported. There are a limited number of measured chromatin states. I think this goes a little bit on this idea of the histone code in which specific pattern of histone modifications will define right the specific transcriptional program, temporal or spatial for each particular gene. The strong association between histone modifications and gene expression, it occurs only at the time of initial activation. And at the time of gene activation, there is a preferential order of marking, and only H3K4 mono and demethylation precede gene expression, which doesn't really mean that they have a causal role, role in real expression. But these other marks, right, either occur with or follow gene activation, and therefore they cannot play a role in the regulation of gene expression. And marking at enhancers, Follows marking at promoters and it is not directly associated, associated with gene expression. So 
This is uh, the acknowledgement. This is the work mostly, as I said, Silvia Perez and Beatriz Forchari, but also other people in my group, Basilis, who is here. And I forgot to say before, uh, before your tweets that the data is all available through the ENCODE portal. And um, I'll, I'll stop here. Thanks. <laughs> Um, if I may ask a question first, <laughs> and then I will pass it. So um, this is very interesting work, and I was wondering uh, to which extent you think that the conclusions that you have are related to the time frame in which your measurements have been done, right? Yeah. Because, I mean, at the end of the day, I don't know how many hours you had, but, uh, you know, it's like a limited system. And, uh, you know, to change the chromatic states, maybe you need more time. Uh, it is true, but uh, you are totally right. So we are taking, uh, in some cases, this is uh, days, I think, right? At the, uh, at initially, there are this, this, the, the, this is a higher time resolution. But in any case, if we see something happening after, right? Uh, I don't think it is really very, I mean, the thing, so we are not, so we cannot demonstrate causality, but we can disprove causality, right? That's the thing. I'm not saying that we are showing that expression is the cause of the markings, but what we are saying is that we see that this march occur after gene expression. We don't see it before gene expression. Of course, it could occur. We measure at 12 hours. We don't see it at nine hours. It could be 10, 11, or 12, but still we don't see it. Of course, I mean, it could be an issue of detection. Right, it could be an issue of detection. It could be that we cannot discard this. That uh, we don't see the mark at nine hours. We see that the gene gets expressed at nine, at nine hours. Well, this is not the, a good plot. So I don't know. For instance, uh, one of these cases that I show here. Yeah, uh, I don't know. We may not see the marking here uh, because uh, we don't have enough uh, resolution with our chip sec assay. Right, this, this is a possibility that cannot be that cannot be ruled out. But in general, we don't see something preceding expression for most of the marks. That's, but yes, of course, having single cell resolution in which you could follow the same cell across time and measuring expression and histone modifications without destroying the cell in the same cell, that would be great, right? Thank you very much. So. You've essentially, you're essentially taking apart the directed graphical model we've had in our head for how these things uh, react to each other in our causal. And essentially what I'm interested in, what I'm thinking about now is, okay, there are now these hidden variables, if you will, or, you know, who, what is, there is another, um, you know, object in there that is causal potentially, but not in the direct relationship we assumed. So what, what are your hypotheses about for what gene that expression? is? I for would both. say I would say that yeah I don't know for I don't know really I don't know for uh, so let me say I probably would say that uh, transcription factors play a larger role in the regulation activation of or in the regulation of gene expression than than histone modifications. I think that they, they, there is a so this one thing right. So a histone a given histone can be modified only once. Right, so a nucleosome that has two histones can be modified only twice. So I'm we're looking at the window of 2,000 bases. There are maybe 10 nucleosomes. Mm -hmm. So this is not like gene expression that you have the gene that can be transcribed maybe one or 1,000 times. Here, this is sort of quite a discrete uh, number of values, right? From say 10 nucleosomes from from one to 20. That's the maximum thing. So once I have the 20 uh, modifications produced in the promoter of a gene, I cannot do any more modification. There is not the capacity. So this is, this is, there is a, there is a uh, maximum threshold that can occur. Therefore, I, I think it's expected that there cannot be a linear relationship between histone modifications and gene expression, because in a give, for a given gene, right, you have this from zero to 20, that's the maximum that can change. Mm -hmm. uh, so now, uh, whether the marks that we see after gene, after gene activation are a consequence of 
of uh, of expression or not this i agree with you i don't know there is a causal link that we we don't we don't know uh, i don't know Well, Dick, very nice work. Uh, so you know that we have a, a work showing that uh, there is no changes in, in transcription level. Right? However, there is a change in alternative splicing, meaning you have several marks of gene bodies in which you didn't find correlation. Nevertheless, it's most likely that there are changes in the level of, of uh, alternative splicing, especially H3K36 trimethylation, which was never been published to be a regulator of alternative splicing. I actually have to embarrassingly answer you that we haven't really looked to splicing during this process. I think that this data is the perfect data to look at this. Yeah. We started this project thinking on this because of splicing, mm -hmm. but uh, because I think that the thing of expression maybe is more striking uh, related to what the people in the field or yeah. outside of the field think. We have focused so far on on, on expression. Basil is here. Uh, I don't know what he is. Or, uh, he's here. Uh, one of the ideas that actually we could look at this data uh, for exactly what you said. So Phil is here and he got the work showing that there are several markers. Yeah, we could look at this. I'm yeah. happy to talk to you and yeah. maybe we could do something be together. Lovely. Because this, I think it's really a, a unique data set in which you have this uh, old Mars and you we have deep RNA seq, so splicing can be well characterized. Yeah, very interesting. So, do you think this has implications for uh, the, the, you know, the correlations we observe in ataxic and blood like, chromatin accessible in general and expression? So, there, especially what you are saying about uh, enhancers, how uh, yeah. you know they are essentially prime mediated by promoters. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I, I think that this is a really good point. We did not generate ataxic for this, uh, unfortunately, for this process. But I believe that the group of Thomas Rapp now has generated toxic, and I think that we should look into this now, really. I think that this is really, because in principle, here we would expect uh, some attack uh, signal on the, on, the, on the promoters of the genes that are, that are activated, I think. Okay. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I was an author on this paper uh, as well, <laughs> your paper. <laughs> okay, okay. So okay. Not, uh... we'll do care later. But I have a question about enhancers. So do you are you concluding the the marks on enhancers um, are not causal or causal? Uh, are Did you rule that out? Are not causal. Not causal. They they actually occur even after. Um, uh, after marking at the promoters and marking after the promoters of course after gene expression so where i have this thing here here uh, i'm not saying that enhancers are not important i'm saying that marking the marks so this cannot is, be causal th this because is, they occur later well this is a this is the proximal enhancers that probably they are not enhancers this is the different this is gene activation and this after or before so of course we see cases in which we see a uh, marking before but in general on average, the normal the the average behavior is that the marking at the at the proximal enhancers occurs after activation, and the distal enhancers here, the distal enhancers here, you may see some anticipation, but less than at the promoters. Mm -hmm. So marking at the promoters occurs first, and then at the enhancers. That's what we see on this model with the caveat of the time resolution mm -hmm, that resolution. we have uh, that Dan actually pointed out that. In this case, maybe maybe important. Okay, that's very surprising. But we should talk about this. <laughs> uh, so I was wondering more about the regulatory program. So have you looked into how it changes? Like, uh, that's, like. So you see the change of the gene across the time points. But I was wondering if there are some genes that are activated before that belong transcription factors that, that could explain like all the chain of activation, maybe yeah. pioneer factors, and then maybe going a bit more into who's regulating who, and maybe that's why the enhancers yeah. are activated later. 
So this is the overall, I didn't mention this, right? This is the overall goal of the, this, the data set because, uh, and again, I'm putting too much uh, pressure on Basilis. But, uh, uh, so what is the data that we have generated here? Yes, yeah, so, yes, so we have, we have different types of RNA. So on the nucleocytosol, we have proteomics data. So the overall aim of this project is to use this data to be able to predict the status of the cell at a particular time point, uh, taking into account the status on the, the, previous, in the, in the previous time point. So whether we are actually able to explain the dynamics to predict the expression of all the genes, to read the expression of all the genes based on the epigenetic uh, factors, the transcription factor data, because we have the proteomics, although transcription factors are not very well represented, and I think, although I have to say, and that's something that, I'm sorry, but if you just take time point and you predict the expression of a gene, just by copying the expression in the previous time point, you will already get very good predictions because many genes don't change expression. Okay, so let's thank uh, all the thank speakers you. of this first session in the morning and we have a break for coffee now coming back at uh, 11.